white men convicted of murdering Ahmaud Arbery, Travis McMichael, he received a second life sentence just moments ago over federal hate crime charges. McMichael, his father Greg and William Roddy Bryan were found guilty in February of interference with rights, which is a federal hate crime and attempted kidnapping in connection to the killing of 25-year-old black man Ahmaud Arbery. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is following the latest outside the courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia. Look, Ron, you've been there since this event happened. You were following this trial. Explain how the sentences today are different from the previous life sentences the men received just earlier this year. The difference is that this is a federal conviction, federal sentencing, and they are already serving time, life in prison, in a state court. And what was unusual about this hearing today was that it was mostly about where they would serve these life sentences as opposed to how long the sentences would be. The defense was arguing strenuously that going to state prison, that being in state prison for these two defendants, for the McMichaels and for William Bryan, for that matter, for all three of them, but we expect the argument to come later this afternoon, is that it's dangerous for them. It's, it's, it's life-threatening. Travis McMichael's attorney said that him going to state prison was the equivalent of what she called a backdoor death penalty for him because there's so much hatred. She said there have been hundreds, thousands of threats directed against McMichael in state prison and that if he goes there, he probably won't survive. For their part, the government said essentially that these defendants deserve no special treatment regardless of, of who they are and regardless of, of what's happened. They should go to state prison and the law says that the first entity to convict, in this case the state of Georgia, is where the defendant, the prisoner, serves their time. Uh, Ahmad Arbery's family certainly wanted them to stay in state prison. Uh, they didn't want the defendants to be able to pick where they could go and, and be in the prison system that, of, their, of, their, of their choosing. Again, the basic difference is that the federal system is thought to be safer, more comfortable, that's an appropriate word, than the state prison system. So that's what a lot of this argument was about today. And we expect more of that when we hear from uh, hear the sentencing hearing of Gregory Michael this afternoon and then William Roddy Bryant, the third man, uh, later this afternoon as well. So, Ron, despite the federal conviction, he will remain in state prison. Clarify that. And also, has the Arbery family, Ahmad's family, have they reacted yet to this new sentence? They haven't reacted yet. We expect to hear from them shortly. They're outside the courtroom now taking a break between hearings. It's a, it's a grueling and very emotional day for them. Again, th this case has been such a, such a, a, a powerful case, such an emotional case um, for, for the family, for this community, uh, for the country for that matter as well. Uh, but to clarify, they, will, they are serving time. Michaels and William Bryan are serving time in state prison now, a life sentence. That's what they get. Brian has the possibility of parole after a number of decades. Uh, unlikely he will ever be paroled, however. That's the distinction. That's where they are now in state prison. They were trying to uh, be moved to federal prison. Uh, the judge sentenced them to life in federal prison and refused to make the switch, which is what the defendants wanted and what the family did not want. So, again, uh, the Arbery family is getting what they want out of this process. They're getting justice, I think they would say. But, of course, this, none of this uh, brings their son back. You know, Ron, uh, you've, you've covered this community, not just the trial, but the community since it happened. And, and you watch the reaction. You watch people's heartbreak. You see, you know, black community leaders. We just saw uh, an image there of Reverend Jesse Jackson coming in. And you talked about sort of the tremors of fear and injustice that this community felt. Does this sentence make any difference for them, for the people who are watching this trial there in Georgia? You know, we'll have to ask people what they think about that. I don't think that this sentence of life in prison was was a big surprise. I think most people expected it, frankly. And I think most people feel like it's appropriate. Um, and, and I think also that it's going to take some time for this community to get past all this. Right. Um, because it still sears very much in the consciousness of this community. All right, NBC's Ron Allen for us there, uh, Brunswick, Georgia. Ron, thank you. Well, it has been an emotional few years for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Being told to, quote, go back to your own country throughout the pandemic, the AAPI community has also seen a sharp rise in hate incidents, including verbal and physical attacks, according to data from Stop AAPI Hate and the FBI. One of the latest racist attacks was directed at New York State Senator John Liu. Take a listen main menu to listen to your messages press one to send john you lost my vote you f piece of f 
with the video from the park. You lost my vote. You lost my whole family's vote. You're losing thousands of votes. You oh, go to back China where you belong. You useless piece of to replay. Press one. Another day at the office. Another day at the office. You know, Senator Lou, you, he shared this video on Twitter last week. He joins me now. I saw it on Instagram. I actually reshared it. I'm so happy that you're joining us today. Just listening it to, to it again, it, it infuriates me uh, to see that hatred. It was spewed so freely. Like, he didn't think twice about calling you and saying all of these things. Tell me, you know, as a public figure, you are certainly have, you have a thick skin. You're, you're no stranger <laughs> to hearing what people think. But this kind of racist attack, how did it hit you the first time yeah. you listened to it? Vicky, thanks so much for bringing this up. I, you know, it's, it, it's not the first time, and it likely won't be the last time that I face this kind of attack. Uh, in fact, in 20 years in office, uh, I've had my share. Mm. Uh, but it's still jarring. And it's, you know, you think about this person making this kind of call against you know, someone like me, I, you know, I'm fairly well protected in a lot of different ways. So I can only imagine if he was upset at some other person, uh, what kind of invective, if not outright violence, this person could direct at, at somebody else. So it's, it's alarming for a lot of reasons. As you mentioned earlier in this report, it, it, Asian Americans have gone through two years of an absolute onslaught of anti-Asian hate, mm -hmm. uh, coincident with the coronavirus pandemic. And, um, you know, we've I, I've done my best to bring about government actions, whether it be more resources or holding people accountable or uh, providing more education about the AAPI community. But it's also about uh, encouraging people to never let these things slide, to mm -hmm. call it out whenever it happens and to report it as much as possible. And so I felt it was, you know, I certainly had to do what I preached. Yeah, we talk about this. It's so important to have context and data points. Uh, and we do have some data points. Some of the FBI data that's come out has shown a threefold increase in anti-Asian crimes in America, more than 300 percent from 2020 to 2021. You talked about why you shared this, because you don't want to let it slide. You don't want people to think this is the norm and that it's OK. Right. What's been the reaction on Twitter, on Instagram, from your constituents? What are people saying to you? Uh, the, you know, the reaction has been very, very positive and favorable. That's certainly not what I was looking for. I just wanted to make sure that people understood this was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of people who understand that this is actually not all that surprising. <laughs> you know, we've all been through it, uh, whether overtly or sometimes indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I was surprised about was the, a very large percentage of people who were just just couldn't believe that this happened. Yeah. And uh, like they don't and realize this is out there. It, and some people are facing it every day, whatever community, right. marginalized community you may be a part of. So it is important to have that dialogue. That's right. And to let people be more aware of the kinds of attacks that Asian Americans and other people have been facing during these uh, really tough times with a global pandemic, with economic uncertainty. Right. Before I let you go, Senator Liu, for people who are maybe hearing about this for the first time, who want to be allies, who want to be supportive, what are some suggestions you have for folks to, to reach out to their friends and people in their community and say, hey, no, you know what? I stand with you. I, I'm not OK with all this racism. Well, specifically on the anti-Asian hate, the, the hate comes from ignorance mm -hmm. and fear and, you know, not understanding a whole lot about the AAPI community. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, look to us a little bit more, understand that we're not the model minority or the perpetual foreigner or even yeah. worse, the, the yellow peril. We are right. people. We are part of American history. We're part of America and treat us accordingly and understand that there are other people who are still ignorant and therefore direct their hate and blame us for a whole bunch of things, including economic recession and no less a global pandemic. Senator John Liu, thank you very much for sharing that and for coming on and providing some insight. And we really, really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thank you. Morris Park neighbors taking a stand against a proposal that would make ex Rikers inmates their new neighbors. They're protesting right outside Jacoby Hospital where that proposed site would be. And News 12's Julio Avila is there. Julio. 
Yeah, that unit would be built inside the Jacoby Hospital campus, and it's also where these neighbors came out for that rally. Now, that project is being spearheaded by NYC Health and the nonprofit organization, the Fortune Society. It would consist of roughly 70 units for those former inmates who are critically ill, but Morris Park residents marched outside today with a clear message. They don't want this medical site in their neighborhood. Now, the rally organizer tells me they're not against helping those less fortunate and that there's already a number of housing units and shelters in the Bronx and also that they feel the Bronx is being treated as a quote unquote dumping ground for these projects. But we're inundated in the Bronx. We're not taking care of ours. I visited three group homes myself and not one, not one person and either of those homes came from the Bronx. They came from Brooklyn, Manhattan and a couple from Queens. Now, NYC Health told us last month that they are looking forward to helping those former inmates, and we reached out to them again, but right now we're awaiting their response. But of course, a lot of overwhelming voices here in objection, and we're going to hear more of those voices as well as have more details tonight at 530. In Morris Park, Julio Avila, News 12. Mayor Eric Adams was at the Port Authority bus terminal early Sunday morning to greet a group of migrant asylum seekers. New York is a city that has always represented the democratic values and the values of our city of showing our compassion. And that's what we're doing today. Joined by the commissioner of the Office of Immigrant Affairs, who described the group of about 14 people who arrived in a bus sent from Texas. Families who were hungry and thirsty, uh, small children. We've said this over and over, but Governor Abbott is doing is cruel. For several months in response to the immigration crisis at the border, the states of Texas and Arizona have been putting asylum seekers on buses and taking them to Washington, D.C. But now Texas Governor Greg Abbott started busing migrants to New York City as he battles with Mayor Adams over immigration policy. Governor Abbott released a statement Friday saying that he had sent the first bus with asylum seekers to Port Authority and saying in part that he hopes he follows through with his promise of welcoming all migrants with open arms. That first bus arrived shortly after with over 40 migrants from Texas. The city had to open 11 emergency shelters in response to the influx of asylum seekers needing shelter. Officials saying at least 4,000 have arrived in the city in the past three months. They're not letting us know what time the buses are leaving. They're not letting us know uh, what are the needs of the people on the bus. They're not giving us any information. Sunday morning, cab drivers waited for the migrants to take those who decided to stay in the city to shelters. Many are immigrants themselves and want to do their part to help those seeking asylum. If you leave your country to come uh, to the United States, is to get a better life. And it's a dream. So we hope that dream will come true. While the influx continues here in the city, the mayor is calling on the federal government for more assistance and resources to better help these migrants. In Manhattan, Arnold Davik, New York One.